how low end the media was because one art form wasn't enough. Say, we've been doing a lot of board game reviews throughout this year, haven't we? And honestly, I'm glad to do them. I still find board games an interesting medium, and while they may not be as big as they once were, the fact that they're still being made and still have a large following brings me joy. Earlier this year, we did board game reviews based on a Goofy movie and the Jumanji reboot, and as I ended that review, I still have a decent number of potential game review candidates lined up. I still have plenty of other tabletop games in my review pile, so which will I possibly do next? And the answer is... none of them. Yeah, you already read the title of the video, you saw the thumbnail, you know what we're talking about. We're going to be revisiting the 2000s Disney Channel champion, Kim Possible. Much like Powerpuff Girls, which we looked at last time, I've done a decent number of KP-themed reviews. I looked at the two TV movies, the series finale, the PlayStation 2 game, and even the DVD releases. But now we're looking at one of the stranger pieces of apparel, something I never thought they would have made. Like I could see Kim Possible dolls, shirts, games, and other such accessories, but a board game? I gotta be honest, I did not see that one coming. And I was like five when they first put this thing out. So, uh... Where exactly did this come from, anyway? Well, the game was made by Milton Bradley and was released in 2003. Keep in mind, the show itself came out in 2002, so you can tell that Disney was ready to slap this girl's name onto anything if it did that well in the span of just one year. As far as I can tell, the game does have decent reception. Most online board game reviews and forums I checked out gave it decent scores, and it seems all the KP heads who used to love the show grew up liking this game. And hey, give them some credit, at least they went ahead and made an original game instead of resorting to taking an old title like Monopoly or Clue and giving it a new coat of paint in the hopes that people would buy it. As fun as those could be, sometimes I'd like to see something original. You know, it's kind of like reboot movies and TV shows when you think about it. <clears throat> what exactly is the sitch with this game? Well, I don't know. All I remember is that the Kim Possible video game was pretty good, so let's see if the same can be said for the board game. This is Kim Possible the board game. So this is the Kim Possible board game, just simply Kim Possible game. The board game. Just rolls off the tongue, right? Uh, this is one of the smaller games that we've reviewed on MediaWiz. Uh, I think the last game that was about this size was probably the Goofy Movie game, and I think before that, that Penguin Icebreaker game that has the really, really terrible <laughs> broken English name, um, and also the Doctor Who game. So there's a couple games that are about this size, but it's, it's one of the smaller games. It's not as big as some of the other ones we've reviewed. Very lovely art on the front pretty much gives away what most of the game is going to be about. You're playing as uh, Kim, Ron, and Rufus trying to stop Dr. Draken, as always. Uh, I like the tagline, cheerleader by day, superhero by night. I like that. Um, yeah, good use of colors. You got the general theme of the show on the front cover. Very good, very good front cover. And this right here says, complete your mission and help Kim Possible save the world. All right. So then flip it over, see what this says. Oh wow, look at that. Got a nice image of what the game board and the pieces and all the setup is supposed to look like. And then over to the side right there, you've got uh, basically a rundown of what the game is going to be. Evil Dr. Draken has a wacko villain plan to take over the world. Can you help local cheerleader and her friends capture the mad scientist and save the world? Not gonna lie, I think that first half actually sold me. Even if I had no idea what the show was about, I think that was a really good way to start. <laughs> I mean, you're not wacko supervillain, that's, that's some great terminology right there. Here's the sitch. You'll receive your very own mission card, and it's up to you to find all the items on it quickly. Watch out for your opponents. They can block you and stop you in your tracks. Once you complete your mission, then hunt down the evil Dr. Draken and capture him. If you can be the first player to capture Dr. Draken, you win! Congratulations! You just saved the world! It includes beginner and advanced rules, so they're, they're, that's, that's going to come into play. There are two different versions of this game. And right over there in the corner you got the little Hasbro logo, and then I like the little watch on Disney Channel and ABC Kids. Because, yeah, the, there was some cross-marketing going on. They had this show on not just Disney Channel, but also ABC Kids. Okay, so flip this back around. Let's see what the game looks like from the inside. So take the game board out. Here's the game board. Here are some of the uh, character piece stands that we're going to be using. And uh, oh man, we got yeah, we got a lot of stuff here. I think this is just supposed to help you with what it's all supposed to look like. I think it's supposed to help you set everything up. 
because uh, yeah, you look, you got basic game setup, and then below you got advanced game setup. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about that when we actually get to the gameplay of this thing. All right, so you got different sets of dice. Again, we're gonna go more over this when we get to the gameplay. But yeah, these are all the different pairs of dice you have to work with. Uh, all of these are the tokens that you're supposed to lay all around the board. Instruction manual right here. This comes very in handy when explaining the rules and the. The, the different gameplay styles that we're gonna get for this. I gotta be totally honest, I have no clue what this actually goes to. Let's see, we got the character tokens. Uh, these things are going to come in handy for the advanced version of gameplay. Since this is an older game, typically expect stuff like this, but this is supposed to come with uh, the, the die. This one in particular, you're supposed to peel some of this stuff off and you're supposed to put it on the die. Uh, but of course, since I got this game off of eBay, and this is a very old game, this goes back to 2003, uh, someone clearly already did that for me. Mission cards, which are going to come in handy for the game. Uh, you're supposed to make sure that, uh, like, I don't know, two to four players who are playing this game are supposed to get these, and this pretty much is what kicks off the gameplay. This sends you on your mission. Alright, and then these are the four main character pieces that you get to work with throughout the game, so that's nice. Alright, so this is basically all the pieces of the game. Now, it's just a matter of setting everything up. So how exactly is the game played? Well, first thing in the instruction manual is they say the first player to go has to be the one that knows the most about Kim Possible. Well, lucky for me, I think I know a certain someone who would like to help with that. Huh. Weird. I was expecting the Planet Goofball fanboys to show up and interrupt me. Come to think of it, they didn't interrupt the last episode either. Well, whatever. Anyway. Well, first of all, there are two ways to play this game. The basic version and the advanced version. The basic version is played with two to four players accepting a mission. Missions taking place on the four different parts of the board. The Possible Family House, the Middleton High School, the Jungle, and Dr. Draken's Lair. Each space representing the missions you obtain throughout the game, like eating dinner, cleaning your locker, fighting Monkey Fist, and of course, stopping Dr. Draken from taking over the world. To win the game, you have to obtain all the token cards that are laid around the board that have images that match up with the four images on your mission cards. So it's sort of like a guessing game. You could take a shot at picking one of the tile cards and see if it matches one of the four images on your card, and if it does match, you can take it off of the board and keep it image side up. If it doesn't match, then you keep the tile up for the other players to see. And be careful, because some of the cards you might land on might be trap tiles, which will hinder your turns. Once you obtain all the cards, you can then get closer to taking out Draken, and once you're able to get close enough to him on the board, you then defeat him and win the game. Now, unlike most games, if you're playing this with just two players, you can actually play more than just one single character. You're given four characters in total, Kim, Ron, Rufus, and Draken, and you move them all around the board. And for whatever reason, Ron and Rufus have to share a spot on the board, which I guess makes sense since they're often paired together. With that one empty corner of the board, why didn't they put Wade there? Why not make Wade a playable character? He's on the spinner and he's on one of the die. Hell, if you want to add another character for someone to play as, why not add Shigo? You can never go wrong with too much Shigo in a Kim Possible related anything. Speaking of, if you land on the Wade space on the spinner, that means you can peek at any of the tiles on the board and see if it matches one of your mission cards, and you could potentially take it later when it's your turn. So in a way, it's kind of thematic of the show. You know, Wade always looking up crucial information on his computer to help out the main characters. So here you can match up the tiles to see if it's what you're looking for. The player's turns are determined by the spinner, and whichever character it lands on means you roll a specific die that coincides with that character. And for whatever reason, this game must hate the number 2 because none of the die that have numbers on it have the number 2. They have 0, but not 2. As for the dragon piece, if you land on him with the spinner, you move him anywhere around the corners of the board to keep him away from our heroes, so that way you can keep the gameplay moving. Once you get all the tile cards on your mission cards, then you can use the spinner to move your character closer to him. For example, say Rufus is on the same space as Draken. So if that's the case, you have to land on Rufus using the spinner to properly capture and defeat Draken. As for the advanced version of this game, these walls are put up which separate the different parts of the board, meaning you can't move your characters as freely as you could in the basic version. They also make it more difficult to get tile cards in this version. You need to roll a specific number on the die to actually get the cards, which also comes with little numbers on the sides. With this, Kim's die usually has the best outcome, and Rufus usually has the worst, with his only having 1s and 4s on them. And the only way to capture Draken with Rufus's die is if you land on a 4. 
So here, it would definitely help to have at least three characters moving around the board, so it would be a little bit easier for one of the main characters to end up capturing Draken. But another way to shake up the gameplay here is that, theoretically, one of the players can steal another player's tile cards, which you're not supposed to do in the basic version. This version also omits the spinner, and instead it's replaced with a white die that has characters all around it, which basically serves the exact same function as the spinner. Whichever character you land on, you have to move them three spaces around the board. Each player is supposed to take at least two of these character tokens, meaning you'll have ten tokens in total. If you manage to score a wall token, that means you can move any of the walls on the board, so that way you can possibly open up a path for yourself. Well, if you're able to get behind the very intricate rules that this game has, does the game still hold up? Eh. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say so. As far as an original game based on a popular franchise that does something new and innovative, I'm actually surprised how well thought out this game was. Before I played it with some friends, I thought it would be a major flash in the pan and wouldn't have much to offer. But I'll be damned. The gameplay was creative, the rules added a fun challenge to the gameplay like flipping between dice and spinner, the board and the pieces themselves are well made, everything about this was pretty well connected to its source material, I gotta say. This is the kind of game I would highly recommend for a game night, especially if you were part of the early 2000s generation and grew up watching and loving this show. Who knows? Maybe when I start reorganizing around here, maybe I can find a spot for this game on Shelf of the Best. Even though, come to think of it, that would actually make it really difficult to get it off if I ever wanted to play it again. Uh, crap, I didn't really think that part through, huh? Holy crap. Monopoly Halo Edition. God, I, I remember when I reviewed this. This was like 2015. This has been on Shelf of the Best since 2016. God, I really do need to update things. I need to find a spot for this. This is probably the best board game I've reviewed in quite a while, to be honest. What are we doing next time? Who knows? Could it possibly be the Powerpuff Girls board game, perhaps? No, we're not doing that next time. It's going to be something Teenage Robot related. And surprisingly, it's actually recent. Yeah, the show that was screwed over by Nickelodeon actually has merchandise coming out in the year 2024. I know, I can't believe it either. But you'll have to wait and see what that is next time. Until then, I'm the Media Wiz, because one art form wasn't enough.